back surgery. Also be in prayer for Brother James and Miss Shirley as they're not feeling well. And then also for uh, Marissa's mom, Roseanne, as she's also under the weather. Uh, be in prayer just one for another uh, this week. And pray that, uh, and then Brother Stewart, I almost forgot about Brother Stewart. He's been battling uh, with an illness for the last week and a half. So continue to be in prayer for all of these people, if you would. Nehemiah chapter number six. And as we look back here in verse number one, it says, Now it came to pass. We are picking up our story now uh, with some time having transpired. And without boring you by way of introduction, let me just remind you what was occurring here in the book of Nehemiah at this point. Nehemiah, as we know, the king's cupbearer, has left Shushan the palace, and he's come to Jerusalem with a, a task to rebuild the walls, to rebuild the gates of the city of Jerusalem. When he gets there, uh, immediately a man by the name of Sam Ballot is distressed or, or upset by his arrival uh, because Sam Ballot is uh, against anything that benefits the people of that area, the, the Jewish people of Ju uh, Judah, that region, and specifically of the city of Jerusalem. And so Nehemiah takes a trip around the city by night, and he looks at all the damage. He, he makes an assessment what needs to be done. He then calls the people together, and he challenges them. And he challenges the people, whether they be merchantmen or whether they be rulers, whether they uh, just be simple laborers, to join together and to do this work, to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem so that this city that once stood as a, a beacon and a, of light and a, a beacon of God's blessings upon the nation of Israel could once again shine forth that message that God is still on the throne. And they rally around Nehemiah and they join hands and they begin the work. And in Nehemiah chapter number three, as we already saw, each person had a place. Each person had a job, something to do. Uh, you had one family in one area. You had another family working maybe over here on this gate here, the fish gate, and, and then further down another family. And, and these people were working together by families to rebuild the city, to rebuild these walls, and to set up these gates once again. And of course, as we saw in Nehemiah chapter number four, Sam Ballad, he's, he's watched what has taken place, and he's brought questions to Nehemiah and tried to get the people to doubt whether or not they should follow Nehemiah. And in chapter number four, he goes ahead and he begins to bring accusations against Nehemiah and the people and the work that they're doing. Uh, he actually criticizes, I should say, not brings accusations, but he, he brings uh, a criticism and he critiques their work and he mocks it. And then when he sees that he can't get them to stop the work, he can't hinder them, he goes ahead and gets together with these other two men that are mentioned here in verse number one. It says, and now it came to pass when Sambalat and Tobiah and Gisha Arabian. He gets together with these other two men, Tobiah and Gisham, and, and some of the other people of the area there. And they decide they're going to go against Jerusalem and attack it by night and put an end to this work. But Nehemiah hears about it. And so he puts people around the city. He gives them each a place where they can stand guard. And they're ready for the attack. And so Sam Ballot backs away. And at the, in chapter number five, as we were reading in chapter number five, we saw how that Sam Ballot and Tobiah and, and Geshem are, are, are back, have, have backed off and they're not in the picture at this point. And Nehemiah goes ahead and he takes care of some problems internally, how that you had people who were well off and they were uh, exercising uh, uh, interest on those who weren't who had borrowed money or maybe who had uh, sold things in order to buy food. And so he takes care of these things that are going on inside the city amongst the people themselves. Now we get to chapter number six, and Sambala and Tobiah and Geshem, these enemies of Nehemiah, these enemies of the people of Jerusalem, these enemies of the work of God that's being done there, rear their ugly heads once again. And it says here that, they weren't alone. It says, Sambalad and Tobiah and Geshem the Arabian and the rest of our enemies. These men are named specifically because they headed up this opposition, but there were others that were against them who were unnamed. There were those that were mentioned just by their nationality. In uh, chapter number 4 and verse number 7, it tells us that the Ammonites, the Ashdodites, which were, of course, Philistines, and then the Arabians, which was what Geshem was, that these groups of people came up against 
the, the Jews and the work that was being done here. So the enemies rear their ugly head again. Remember we talked about the fact that we have an enemy this morning, Satan. We are battling Satan each and every day of our lives. We are in a spiritual battle against the evil forces uh, of Satan and those that are with Satan, the, the demons of this world, the principalities, as the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter number 6, of this world. And we have, are on the Lord's side. If you are a born-again, Bible-believing Christian this morning, you are on the Lord's side. You are on the winning side. But you are in this spiritual battle, and you will be in the spiritual battle until the day you pass on or until the day Jesus Christ comes back. Now, we see here that these enemies, as I said, rear their ugly head. Because they hear something. In verse number one, look there if you would with me again. It says that they heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left therein. Nehemiah and the people have made progress here. They've made a lot of progress. We at one time put on the overhead for you a picture of the city of Jerusalem or a, a, a map of the city of Jerusalem and showed you the various gates that were there and, and how large the city was and the work that had to be done. And remember, this took some time. They didn't rebuild this city overnight. They worked and they watched and they worked and they watched and they pressed on until all of the breaches had been taken care of that were on the walls. But there's a notation left here in parentheses in verse number one that says, though at that time I had not set up the doors upon the gates. They had made a lot of progress, but the work was not done. Now, let me stop here and make an application real quick to us and to our church. Remember, when we're talking about the work of God, and when we, we read about the work of God here, the way that it applies to us is, first it applies, if you're a married this morning, it applies to your marriage. And then second, to your home. And then third, to your church. God is trying to work with us and through us to do something great in our marriage relationship with our spouse, in our relationship with our children so that we can raise children that honor and glorify and love Him, and in our church so that a work can be built and, and, and people's lives can be saved and changed, uh, that something uh, uh, miraculous and glorious can be done here for the cause of Christ. Can I tell you once again that the work of the Lord will never be finished until Jesus Christ comes back. Right. Now, we make progress, but it's never finished. As I look back at the history of our church, and last week we walked through the building, someone was talking to me about the history of our church, and of course we met for years, 20-plus 20, 20 years there on Grove Avenue, and then moved here for the last two and a half years, and Lord willing, here in, in another month, we'll be in, in a building of our own. As all of that transpires, and if all of it transpires as we believe it will, we have to remember when we get into that permanent location that the work's not done. We have to remember that, yes, progress has been made, but the work is not completed. There's still stuff that needs to be done. As I said in the Sunday school hour, the work has actually just begun. And Nehemiah mentions here, he says, hey, we took care of all the breaches on the walls themselves, but the gates... The doors of the gates had not been hung yet. There was still some work that needed to be done. The enemy heard about it. Sambalad and Tobiah and Geshem and the rest of the enemies, the Ammonites and the Ashdodites or Philistines, they heard that the, the breaches had been uh, taken care of. They heard that progress was going on over there. If you would uh, allow me this morning to say at the First Baptist Church of Jerusalem, amen. They heard that a work was going on. Of course, we know it wasn't a Baptist church per se because it was the Old Testament. But nonetheless, I'm just going to say that this morning for our application. They heard that something was going on over there. And remember, they're the enemies of Nehemiah. And he specifically calls them enemies here. In Nehemiah 4.15, he called them enemies. In Nehemiah 5.9, he called them enemies. And he was not happy about it. And so Sam Ballot has a plan as he always does. We've already seen, as we've studied the book of Nehemiah, how that uh, Sambal reacted. Remember, he was grieved that Nehemiah showed up. 
Then he began, as we said, to question the work that they were doing. Were they coming there uh, to cause problems? And then he criticized, as I just mentioned a few moments ago, and then he uh, threatened to attack. And we've already seen all that, but Sam Ballot now uh, has a plan. And we're going to see he tries to do three things here. The three things that Sam Ballot and Geesham and Tobiah and the rest of the enemies tried to do are the same three things that I believe that Satan is either trying to do or is going to try to do in our church and in our homes and in our lives to bring opposition against us. By the way, I find it interesting that we've only read through six chapters of the book of Nehemiah to date, and we have read about these enemies over and over again which tells me that as a Christian, I need to keep my head on a swivel. In other words, I need to be prepared because the enemy is out there, and just as uh, the work is never finished, the enemy never gives up. The enemy, Satan, he is never going to give up. Is he going to be defeated? Absolutely. We've read the back of the Bible. We know how it ends in the book of Revelation, but he's not going to give up. He's not going to throw in the towel, and so we better be ready each and every day. Look with me, if you would, in verse number 2. It says that Sam Ballad and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me mischief. Verse number 3, And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I'm doing a great work, so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? Verse 4, yet they sent unto me four times after this sort, and I answered them after the same manner. The first thing that they tried to do, or the first part of Sam Ballot's plan, was to get Nehemiah to compromise. The devil wants Christians today to compromise. Here, Sam Ballot and Geshem say, hey, Nehemiah, why don't you come and meet with us? Uh, we, we want to talk with you. Now, wait a second. You didn't want to talk a few chapters ago when you were questioning the work that we were doing. You didn't want to talk a, a couple chapters back when you were criticizing the work that we were doing. You didn't want to talk back in chapter number four when you threatened to come by night and attack our city. You didn't want to talk then, but now, now Sam Ballad, now Geshem, now Tobiah, now you guys want to talk. Why? There's a reason. They wanted him to compromise. They wanted him to compromise what he was doing. And Nehemiah saw through this. And that's why he wrote in verse number two, they thought to do me mischief. Can I tell you this morning that compromise is the result, or what it results in is mischief in a Christian's life and in the work of the Lord. The devil is out there. And in Christianity today, he's offering compromise left and right. You don't have to have traditional gospel singing anymore. You don't have to have traditional hymns anymore. You don't have to have a teaching and preaching that comes from the Word of God. You can just get up there and, and you can teach or you can preach uh, uh, maybe from a, a, a book that someone wrote. How to be a good Christian in 10 steps. The devil is out there trying to get us to compromise. <laughs> He is willing to offer us a compromise, to make a truce with us as Christians. And you notice the name of the place where he wanted to meet them in verse number two, in the plain of, oh no. Hey, the devil wants to get you to compromise today, Christian. He wants to get you to compromise so that uh, that marriage is not as strong as it ought to be and that family is not what it ought to be and the church is weakened. He wants to get you to compromise and you need to look at it and say, whoa, wait a second, where is he trying to take me? What does he want to do in my family and in my church and in my life? And you need to say, oh no, I'm not going there. I'm not headed down that path. Because I know what's going to happen. Mischief is going to come. Notice also in verse number three, uh, Nehemiah's response. He says, it says that he sent messengers to these men. And he says, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? He says, I am doing a great work. By the way, never forget that the work that God is doing in you and through you and with you is the greatest work on the face of the earth. That marriage that you have, God trusts you to make it work. 
that family, those children that God has given to you, God trusts you to raise them so that they know Him and love Him and reverence Him. Hey, this church, this work here, uh, getting the gospel out to our community and to the world around us, it is the greatest work on the face of the earth. There is no other work that is great as the work of God. I was talking to someone just Thursday night after the service. We went over to the ball field and watched the end of a game Thursday night. Sat down, I was talking to someone, and I've had a few conversations with this individual over the last month or so, and this person has made this comment to me more than once. They said, Pastor Miller, you have a hard job being a pastor. And they named reasons why it was hard, and I said, you know what, you're right. Sometimes it is hard being a pastor. I said, but, and I know I've told you folks this before, and I told this person that, I said, but there's nothing else I'd rather be doing. Why? Because it's God's work. Hey, it's not easy to go out and share the gospel with people. You folks know that. You're doing it. It's not easy to get up early in the morning, get up earlier than you're used to getting up and making sure that you spend time in the Word of God, praying and reading, uh, reading it, uh, reading the Word of God and studying it. Hey, but it's a great work and God wants to use you and bless you. And so, hey, you have to make sure you remember this is God's work and there's nothing greater than it. And for that reason, I'm not going to compromise. Folks, we could have had larger crowds here at this church five years ago when I came if we would have compromised some things in our church. We could compromise our standards. We could compromise our convictions. We could compromise our worship service. We could compromise our Bibles. We could compromise a lot of things. But you know what? When you compromise, mischief always ends up coming. You know how many people I have talked to that have come from churches that have compromised on the Word of God or they've compromised on music in the church service that have come to me and they've said, wow, there's something different about your guys' church. You know what the difference is? It's not the pastor. And as much as I love you folks, it's not the people. It's the Word of God. It's because it's the work of God. And when God is there, people know it. Hey, we need to make sure we don't compromise. Going on, you notice how it says in verse number four that they sent messengers to Nehemiah four more times. So five times they sent messengers saying, hey, come meet with us. Hey, come on, come down and meet with us. We, we can come to a truce here, Nehemiah. Five times over and over and over and over and over again they sent messengers. And every time Nehemiah said, nope, I'm not coming down. I've got a great work to do. I'm sorry. I don't have time to compromise. Once again, let me remind you, Satan is not going to give up. He is going to continue to work on you and try to get you to compromise and say, well, I guess I really don't need the Word of God. I guess I really don't have to pray. I guess I really don't need to be in church. I guess I really don't need to be separated as a Christian. I guess I really don't need those things. I, I can compromise. He's going to keep coming at you and attacking you, trying to get you to give in, but don't give in. Stand your ground. Second thing that Sambal tried to do, or the second part of his plan, verse number five, it says, Then sent Sambal his servant unto me in like manner the fifth time with an open letter in his hand, wherein was written, It is reported among the heathen, and Gashmu saith it, that thou and the Jews think to rebel. For which cause thou buildest the wall, that thou mayest be their king, according to these words. And thou hast also appointed prophets to preach of thee at Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah. And now shall be reported to the king according to these words. Come now, therefore, and let us take counsel together. The fifth time that he sent a messenger to him, trying to get him to compromise, he took his plan to another level. And he went from compromise and trying to get him to compromise to simply accusing him. Accusing him of doing wrong. Notice here he says in verse number 6 that it's reported among the heathen. Those that were unbelievers. And he mentions a gentleman, specifically a man by the name of Gashmu. And he says, you know, it's, it's common knowledge out here where we are at that you, Nehemiah, have come and built, rebuilt these walls because you have an, uh, 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 a subtle plot going on. You have an ulterior motive. That ulterior motive is you want to be a king. And you've told the people that once the walls are rebuilt, then you're going to be their king, and they are going to uh, rebel against the king who has sent you, the king of Babylon, and they're going to rebel against him. And we know 
about your plan. And we're going to make sure that the king hears about it. So since the king's going to hear about it, why don't, you, why don't you just come over here and talk with us and compromise? Verse number 8, Then I sent unto him, saying, There are no such things done as thou sayest, but thou feignest them out of thine own heart. That word faint, feignest, excuse me, means fake, false. For they all made us afraid, saying, Their hand shall be weakened from the work, that it be not done. Now therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. He responds to these accusations by saying, Sam Bell, you don't know what you're talking about. There's nothing like that going on here. I don't want to be a king, and the people aren't trying to elevate me to be their king, and we are not rebelling against the king, the king of Babylon, who sent me here to do this work. Accusations arise. When you're trying to do something for God, your character will be assaulted. People will accuse you. As you are working on that relationship with your spouse, guess what's going to happen? You think Satan's going to sit back and just let everything go according to plan and let those walls get rebuilt and those gates get hung or those doors get hung on the gates? No, he's going to attack. He's going to try to get you to compromise. And if he can't get you to compromise, he's going to try to accuse you. The Bible teaches us that we need to be above reproach. I went by to visit someone uh, two months ago. And this was an older lady, and I had to go by and visit her uh, for someone. And uh, I went by her house and knocked on the door, and she opened the door. And she said, why don't you come on in? And I said, actually, ma'am, I can't. She goes, why? I said, uh, for testimony's sake. I said, uh, if no one else is at your house, I said, I can't enter your house because if someone else sees me going in, they don't know why I'm going into your house. And this lady was old enough to be my mother. But I said, you know what? I want to be above reproach. And she goes, well, I can't come outside. And I go, well, I can't come inside, but I need to talk to you. So she got me a chair and I put the chair outside the door and I sat there on her front uh, doorstep and talked to her. Uh, and she sat down right there in the doorway and we talked. Hey, I want to make sure my testimony's right. Amen. I want to make sure that nobody can accuse me as the pastor of doing anything that's wrong. And by the way, as an individual, as a Christian, you need to protect your testimony because Satan is going to accuse you. He's going to accuse you to your spouse. He's going to accuse you to your children. He's going to accuse you uh, to other believers. You need to make sure that you're above reproach because Satan's not just going to sit back and let you do that work of the Lord and, and not attack you. He's going to come after you and he's going to cause people, he's going to try to put into people's minds thoughts that, oh, this person has ulterior motives. Oh, they don't really want to serve. They really want to be elevated. Hey, if you're a teacher in our our, uh, our church, if you are an usher, if you're a nursery worker, hey, be prepared because Satan's going to try to attack. He's going to try to get people to say, oh, yeah, well, the only reason you work in the nursery is because you're looking for a, a better position in the church eventually. Really? Changing diapers? You, you volunteer to change diapers because you're looking for a better position in the church? My wife, uh, she has the position of being the, the pastor's wife, and she doesn't get paid for that. Amen. So I don't know how much higher you, you want to how much higher you can go, but that's the way the devil will work. He's gonna try to accuse. He's gonna try to attack your character. He's gonna try to attack your motives. Oh, yeah, you're going to church, but you're only going to church for this reason. Hey, just stay faithful. Just remember you're doing this for God. Nehemiah says, hey, Sambal, you can accuse me, but that's not what's going on here. We are doing this. We are rebuilding these walls for him, not for me. For him, we're doing this. And then he asked God for strength because he knew that Sambal's words were going to get around. You, you've always heard that saying, or we all heard that saying when we were growing up, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And we know that is probably the most foolish statement out there because words do hurt. Words hurt a lot. And when people say something, that plants thoughts. Satan tries to plant thoughts into other people's minds. And Nehemiah, he knows these words are going to start weakening some of the people that are working with him, trying to do this work for the Lord, because they're going to start having thoughts. Well, wait a second. Maybe that's why Nehemiah is here. I mean, why would a king's cupbearer leave that? opportunity that he had to serve the king and, and, and work in the palace there in Shushan, to come all the way back here to rebuild walls in this broken down old city. Why would he do that? Maybe he does want to be our king. Hey, Satan wants to accuse you. 
Not only does he want to accuse you, he wants to uh, get in there and attack and make weak others around you. When that happens, we need to be making sure that we are praying to God and saying, Lord, strengthen our hands. Lord, help us. And then the third thing we see that he tried, the third part of his plan is found in verse number 10. Afterward, I came unto the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabel, who was shut up. And he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. And let us shut the doors of the temple, for they will come to slay thee. Yea, in the night will they come to slay thee. And I said, should such a man as I flee? And who is there that being as I am would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. The Bible says here that this, uh, this man came, uh, that he came to this man, Shemaiah. And Shemaiah was shut up. He was shut up in his home, and Nehemiah came to visit him. And this man says to Nehemiah, he says, Hey, let's go to the house of God. Let's go to the temple together, and let's uh, barricade ourselves inside. So that way Sam Ballot can't get to us. He was trying to... Ne uh, Sam Bal was trying to get Nehemiah to flee, to run away, to hide. He says, let's run and let's uh, shut up the doors of the temple. We'll, we'll uh, make sure that no one can get in and we'll shut ourselves in the temple. And Nehemiah says, why should I flee? Who is there that being as I am would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. The devil wants to get believers to run and to flee. And he'll try to attack to the point where you get discouraged and you just throw in the towel and you shut yourself up and you say, oh, I, I can't go to church anymore. I just can't go anymore. You're going to say, oh, I can't. I don't, I don't have time to open the word of God anymore. I'm just too busy. And he's going to try to get you to flee from God and from the, your relationship with God and from the things of God and from the work of God. This man Offer this to Nehemiah. And Nehemiah said, I'm not going to do it. And look at verse number 12. It says, And lo, I perceive that God had not sent him. Nehemiah had wisdom enough to realize that this man was not being sent from God. It goes on to say, But that he pronounced this prophecy against me, for Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. Therefore was he hired that I should be afraid and do so in sin, and that they might have matter for an evil report that they might reproach me. My God, think thou upon Tobiah and Sambalat according to these their works and on the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets that would have put me in fear. Satan wants us to be afraid. And he wants to get us to run. He wants us to flee from the work. Run away. Hey, you save yourself. Get away from it. It's too much problems, too much trouble. You know, sometimes uh, people, they start getting close to God and they become a Christian and, and they start having a walk with the Lord and they start coming to church and they, uh, they start uh, uh, sharing their faith and they get involved in the ministries of the church. And guess what happens? They get attacked. They get criticized or accused. Bad things start to happen in their lives. And before you know it, they say, well, man, I didn't know all this was going to happen. I'm out of here. I mentioned last year, and, and, and it, was, it was said, it wasn't really said in jest, but it was, it was a lighthearted comment. I said that I got to the point last year where I decided I wasn't, we weren't going to train anybody else in our church how to run the sound, except for Brother Chris and Brother Josh. Because we kept trying to find other individuals that could help run the sound. Because Brother Chris works on Thursday nights and Brother Josh works some Sundays like today. And every time we found someone and we trained them, guess what? A month later, they were gone. They were out of church. And so then we'd find someone else and we'd train them. And then a month later, I'm not lying, a month later, they were out of church. Because when you start doing something for God, guess what happens? You're going to have opposition. And Satan is going to try to get you to compromise. And if he can't get you to compromise, he's going to try to accuse you and ruin your testimony and discourage you. And if he can, he's going to try to get you to run away from the thing that you should be running to, which is God and the work of the Lord. Here in Nehemiah, he stood his ground. Look at verse number 15 and we'll close this morning. Look at verse 15 real quick. And look at how this ends. So the wall was finished. 
when you stand your ground and you stick with it and you stay doing the work of the Lord, the work gets done. Folks, as I said, right now, I believe that God has just opened the windows of heaven and, and poured out a blessing upon our church in a great and mighty way. But I believe with that as well, opposition, if it's not already here, it's coming. Satan is going to attack over the next month, over the next few months, over the summer, over the rest of the year. And he's going to attack by trying to convince us to compromise in our personal lives and in our church. He's going to try to attack us. He, he's going to bring accusations against us. He's going to try to get us away from God and away from our faith in God. This uh, A week ago, Friday, I went to the dentist. I, I mentioned this story, I think, in a Thursday night service or maybe last Sunday. I went to the dentist, and I hate going to the dentist, I'll be honest with you. Not because I'm afraid of anything the dentist has, except for the bad news that the dentist always has to share with me. I'm looking forward to when we get to heaven, because when we get that new body, guess what I get? A new set of teeth, amen? And they're all going to be mine, and they'll last for all eternity. And if the Lord allows, I'm going to drink soda for all eternity and not worry about losing my teeth, amen? And so I went into the dentist, and the dentist said, well, okay, I had a, a tooth that broke on me about two months ago, but I didn't go in because it wasn't bothering me. Now it's bothering me, and I've had, I had two teeth pulled last year because they broke. And uh, they, were, they, had, they were root canals with crowns on them. And so the dentist says, well, just so you know, they started educating me. I'm thankful for a dentist that will explain things. And they started educating me on what was happening there. Uh, where those two teeth have been pulled out. And they said, okay, well, we need to go ahead and do a root canal on your mouth and uh, on that one tooth. And I said, okay. So they gave me the plan and we're going to try to get it going. And this last week I was supposed to set up a time to go in. It seemed like I got busy and, I, and here and there, and I never had a, an opportunity to go in. By the end of this past week, oh, my tooth was hurting. I, I think Thursday morning, I woke up at 1.30 in the morning and I didn't go back to bed because it my mouth was hurting and my ear was starting to uh, really ache. And then, praise the Lord, as the day went on, it got better and I was doing fine. And then Friday seemed fairly decent. And then Saturday it happened again. And then this morning, uh, Saturday morning, I woke up about 2 o'clock and stayed up all morning because I couldn't go back to sleep. And, and then this morning, I got up a, a little bit earlier than normal at 4. Same thing. And my wife said, oh, man, you know, what, what are we going to do? I said, I'm going to get into the dentist as soon as I can. I said, but I know this is just the devil trying to attack. I said, honestly, this is the devil trying to attack. I said, my tooth was broken for two months and it didn't hurt until we started going through this process with the building. And someone says, preacher, are you saying that, that physical ailments are related to spiritual battles? Yes. <laughs> yes, they are. A lot of times they are. By the way, this morning I was sitting on the couch when I woke up at four o'clock. And you know, when you wake up and you don't feel good, you just, you want to do, you don't want to do anything. So I thought, you know what? There's still... One thing out there, I mentioned on Thursday nights, there's not a lot of good stuff on TV anymore, but there's one thing out there I still like to like, I still like to watch and it's still clean. And so I thought, oh, you know what? I don't feel like doing anything right now. It's four in the morning. I'll just turn on an episode of this. And so I watched this and these people were coming up and they were uh, presenting inventions they had and stuff like that. And I got done watching it and my tooth was still hurting. In fact, it was hurting more. My ear was aching even more. I thought, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. And so I went in. I thought, okay, I'll jump in the shower. So I took a shower and I got out and I, it was still aching. And the Lord said, you know what? Why don't you just try quoting some scripture and stop thinking about yourself? And so I started quoting scripture verses out loud to myself. I kept Actually, the verse I kept quoting was Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. You know, some versions of the Bible change that to, I can do all things through Christ, who strengtheneth me. The reason why you don't change the word of God is because you'll change the context of the verse. That verse is not teaching us that we can do anything with God's help, but we can do anything that strengthens us with God's help. And there's some things that God allows in our lives because He knows that it's going to mold us into a, being a better Christian and a better parent and a better spouse. And so I was quoting that verse, and guess what happened? I stopped, my ear stopped hurting. And my tooth stopped hurting after about probably five, ten minutes. Now, the rest of the morning, I haven't had a problem. But I've kept thinking about that. Why? Because I haven't been focusing on myself. I've been trying to focus on what needs to be done today for the cause of Christ. Ultimately, the devil's going to attack us spiritually. And you're going to be affected physically. 
there's going to be some ailments that are going to come in your life and the devil's going to try to use them to discourage you, to get you to uh, flee from God and to flee from your faith in God. Let me encourage you, stand your ground. Stand your ground because the work is a great work and it needs to be done. Let's pray. Father, thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for all that you've given to us. Lord, I thank you for each and every person here this morning. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to take what we've read and studied from the book of Nehemiah. And I pray that you'd help us to apply it to our hearts and to our lives. Father, we know that you have a great work for us to do, individually and collectively.